Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this show, Frayne Olson from North Dakota State analyzes the wheat markets. Al Dutcher will forecast precipitation chances through winter. Ken Green looks at the state of agriculture. And Galen Erickson will discuss forage inventory during winter. Frayne Olson is our marketing analyst this week. We talked with Frayne Thursday morning about wheat issues in Australia and Ukraine and why he believes corn, soybean, and wheat markets have met their highs. But as winter wheat seeding is wrapping up across the country with a good portion now emerging, we started by asking if he was concerned about growing conditions. Yeah, that's something that the market's starting to take a little bit more focus on right now. Um, the, the last crop conditions report we got was about 30%, or uh, 36% of the winter wheat crop was in good to excellent rating condition, compared to about 50% at this time last year. And I guess as you dig into the numbers, uh, uh, probably a more troubling statistic or troubling numbers is that we've got the soft red winter wheat crop that's really offsetting some of the more poor conditions that we have in the winter wheat country. So for example, based on, on Monday's report, the Nebraska winter wheat conditions were about 15% good to excellent. So the winter wheat crop is in much tougher condition than the soft red winter wheat crop, and those, those two are kind of balancing each other out. So um, even though there's a relatively poor correlation or relationship between winter wheat conditions at this time of the year and final yields, it is something that, that I know the markets are concerned about and we need to keep looking at as, as we move through the winter months. So you're saying there is time to bounce back, uh, not panic mode yet? Well, winter wheat is an amazing crop. I mean, it, it's very resilient and has a way to compensate in particular in the spring when we start tillering and it comes out of dormancy. And so the weather conditions as we break dormancy will really be the determining factor as, as we move forward on kind of setting our base yield expectations move overseas. Let's move into Ukraine where we've heard both sides of whether or not that country is going to impose an export ban. What do you think ultimately happens there? Yeah, that, that we've been getting very mixed signals whether the Ukrainian government is going to through, uh, uh, impose an export ban on wheat like they did a few years ago. Um, in 2010, both Russia and then later on Ukraine and Kazakhstan imposed export bans on their, on their wheat. And the interesting thing is this year, in 2012, they actually have lower production than they did in 2010 when they put the export bans on. I, I think one of the things they learned in the process in 2010 was an export ban works pretty well to limit exports and to help uh, soften domestic prices, but it also causes a lot of chaos and confusion in the international market because a lot of the contracts that are in place have act of God clauses or essentially act of government clauses that if an export ban is put in place, the contracts that are currently in existence are null and void. And so there were some international buyers in 2010 that were really left scrambling for not only future purchases, but also to refill purchases they had on the books. And so, so for I that guess, reason, you think maybe they don't, they don't shy to it or, or they shy away from it, I guess? I, I think there's, there's some conflict going on internally now to say, well, we need to control kind of or, or try and mitigate some of the high prices we're seeing domestically for wheat and bread products in the Ukraine and, and Russian regions. But, you know, the export ban didn't work the way we really had hoped longer term. So in my view, I think a more, more likely scenario would be an export tax so that the existing contracts in place are still kept in place and are able to be executed, but it would really impact future sales as we move forward in time. So 
Again, the market's trying to figure out, well, you know, what is the export opportunities for the U.S. grains into that, into that region? Then you look at Australia and they have dryness concerns there, but I know as we talked yesterday, you thought uh, there may be some quality concerns as well. Well, I, I think that is also a developing story. Um, the current expectation is that the, the Australian crop is going to be down fairly significantly from last year. Last year they produced between 29 and 30 million metric ton. The current forecast that have USDA is for about 21 million metric ton coming out of the Australian market. Um, the other thing that's starting now to develop is, yeah, most of the, the major producing re regions have had some dry weather uh, during their production season, but now as they get into harvest, they're actually having some rainfall, and so the rainfall is raising some concerns about quality issues. Um, so some of the, the milling wheat that we had expected to come out of the Australian market may slip into the feed category, which I do think will open the doors for some, some more export opportunities for U.S. grains. You look at corn, wheat, soybeans, uh, violent start to the week this week, and now it's kind of cooled off. But do you look at it now and say that in, in all three commodities there, the high is passed? I guess in my viewpoint, I think the high, the, at least on the futures side, the high has been reached at least for a while. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, we had the really rapid run up this summer as drought conditions continue to develop and expand and, and worsen. Um, there was a couple things going on. First, there was this risk factor that was built into the market saying, well, we're not really sure how bad the conditions are. And we're getting more information now about, you know, what actual yields are coming out to be. And they're a little bit better than we had expected. The other thing, you know, as we got into the rationing mode of the marketplace, um, high prices are expected to try and ration use. And we've already seen some of the use cut back. Um, some of the end users are shifting to other sources. They're actually using less than we had expected. So I, I do, as we look forward in time, I think we're going to see, there's still some uncertainty in the market, obviously, but I do think that we have seen the highs in the market for, for at least for the next several months. We know soybeans are tied directly to South America, but corn and wheat, where are the, the movers there? I mean, what, what affects that? Well, I guess short term, you know, it looks as though we're in a fairly narrow trading range now that's developed for both corn and wheat. Uh, wheat's been in that trading range a little bit longer than corn has. Um, some of the it shocks to the system as we look forward in time. A couple of them obviously comes outside of agriculture in the form of continuing economic concerns and, and budget problems in Europe, but also that obviously the developing story here with domestic, uh, um, you know, the, the domestic problems we're having with uh, our debt issue and the fiscal cliff that everybody's talking about. And, and those will have an impact on the crop markets if, if they turn in a very negative sense. Next week, we'll talk with Shane Ellis from Iowa State for his views on the livestock markets. National gasoline and diesel prices both fell last week. Gas to $3.44 a gallon and diesel to $3.98 a gallon. That puts both fuels nearly even with where they were at this time last year. Gasoline has now dropped for five straight weeks and is at its lowest level since mid-July, while diesel is under $4 a gallon for the first time since mid-August. With harvest mostly complete in the state, many farmers are probably thinking about planning for next year's crop. Cattle producers who took cows off pasture earlier than normal this season are probably wondering what shape grasses will be in at the beginning of next season. As drought continues, we talked with Al Dutcher Wednesday about his winter outlook and how set back Nebraska is after months of drought. Well, I think we got to pick, take this into two parts. First is what was the impacts of the drought of 2012? We look at the cropping year from October 2011 through into September. If you look at the total deficits accumulated across the state, in the Panhandle and the, in the western sand hills were running about six to nine inch deficits and cost northeast Nebraska 12 to 15 inch deficits. So in order for us to significantly cut into this drought, we're going to have to make up some of those deficits. About half of them should be applied to the very wet period before that, the other half to this dry period. So an estimate would be that we're going to need to be about seven and a half inches above normal for whatever period we define to make up those deficits in northeast, about four and a half to six inches across western Nebraska. Northeast Nebraska, if we wanted to make up all those deficits by the time we get through the end of April next year, it's going to require somewhere around, uh, best guess, 15 to 18 inches. Across the western part of the state, we're probably looking at about 
12 to 14 inches, which represents about 150% of normal from now through the end of April to completely eliminate the drought. That's a huge amount of ground to make up. That's 150% of normal, and you find very few instances of that in historical records where we see that type of habit. Probably less than a 5% chance. As dry as it's been so far this month even, uh, are the weather patterns mirroring what we had last year? No, I would argue that they're not. Yes, we are seeing the dry conditions, but we have to look at it in terms of temperature and precipitation. What we notice is that we got the third week of August, we've seen a pretty significant cold front move through the upper plains region that kind of broke the heat, that we the extensive heat, brought our first significant precipitation of southeast Nebraska, missed much of the remainder of the state. But since then, we've been in a persistently cool pattern. And in fact, for the last 60 days, most of Nebraska is averaging two to four degrees below normal. Now we have been warm recently and there's no saying that we're not going to see periods of warmth, but if you look at the way the distribution pattern in the United States has been in terms of above normal and below normal, consistently the areas east of the Rocky Mountains have seen primarily below normal temperature for the last 60 to up to 90 days. Areas west of the Continental Divide have seen above normal temperatures and I really don't see much variance of that. Yes, we may go through periods of warmth and cold, but overall the trend appears to be much cooler than normal. We're just not seeing the precipitation making it to the surface here in Nebraska, particularly in the hard hit areas of the Sand Hills, South Central and Southwest Nebraska. Big question is, does that change? What's your outlook going forward as we move through winter, both in precipitation and, uh, and temperature? Well, the big thing that we're dealing with is that the El Nino event that we thought was going to occur doesn't appear it's going to form as anticipated. We may see periods where El Nino-like conditions have materialized for several weeks, but overall we're not expecting a solid El Nino signal. So the northern jet is going to become the big player this winter, as it has already done. We've seen big storms erupting both on the east coast and the upper plains. We've seen some pretty significant wind events, and we've seen some pretty significant cold air infiltrations, only to see it move rapidly above normal when we get a high pressure building law. So if this trend continues, we'd expect to see rapid swings in temperatures. At some point, we would expect the jet to start slipping a little bit farther south. Which means? Which means that the big storms in the upper plains should start to move southward in response to the jet pushing southward. It usually reaches maximum southerly extent somewhere around the third to fourth week of January before it starts making northern progress. So if these patterns continue, I would expect to see a couple of pretty significant storms, at least somewhere in the central plains. We have the chance for limited moisture. I don't think there's anything in the signal that shows that we're going to be extensively wet. So we, we probably will see a little semblance of winter, much, much colder than last winter. But in the same token, we're probably not going to see this drought completely eradicated by next spring. But again, we could have significant recovery in our agricultural drought and yet still carry a pretty steep or hydrological drought. It's going to take a lot longer for that to be eliminated. And so water issues become very, very important for western Nebraska. But I would, what I would tell producers is prepare as if we're going to enter a second year of drought with the hope that Mother Nature will provide enough relief that we will not see the materializing conditions like we did this growing season push out into next growing season. We'll have more from Al later in the show when he gives his short range forecast for the coming week. The American Farm Bureau Federation says Thanksgiving dinner will be just a bit more expensive this year. The informal price survey for a 10-person meal shows a 28-cent increase from last year to $49.48. When the survey began in 1986, the survey showed a Thanksgiving dinner cost $28.74, over $20 cheaper than it is now. Farm Bureau's information is an informal gauge of price trends, and the items for the study have remained unchanged during its 27 years to allow for consistency. Over the past few months, we've covered drought concerns dealing with each sector of the ag industry. As we move into colder months, Galen Erickson says producers should think about their supplies of feed and forages because of how short those stocks might be. Well, I think with the year we're having and the drought and the higher prices on all feeds, that includes forages, grain, and uh, distillers and other byproducts, one of the concerns we have is, is a lot of producers have put off some purchasing decisions, and so I worry a lot about having inventory control. Now, the minute I encourage everybody to buy a bunch of inventory, the prices are going to drop, but uh, this might be a good year to make sure you've got plenty of forage, uh, grain and byproducts, whatever you're feeding, uh, at least tied up and maybe even in control of, of your own inventory. The other comment I would make is that uh, uh, if, you, if you have access to grazing residue or, or stalks, uh, it'd be also good to get those now because of the nice weather we're having. To be honest, I think some of our concerns going into the fall with the drought on whether that was aflatoxin or nitrates, etc., uh, 
so far so good. Haven't had any reports of really major challenges. And so the only thing might be nitrate still on forages if you know it's from drought, drought damage. But the benefit of stalks is, that especially if you're grazing, is that nitrates are going to be in the stem, and uh, they're generally don't don't force them to be grazing the stem because that creates a lot of other energy limitations, etc. So no, I think uh, so far so good. We haven't had our, our quality of our feeds are better than what we may have predicted back in August. We will have cold temperatures at some point. Uh, so far, actually. Having lack of rainfall from a cattle perspective in the winter especially is a plus because uh, it allows them to maintain their body temperatures even easier than it would if it was cold and wet. Uh, so lack of rain is a good thing from a cattle perspective, at least during the winter. But uh, cold stress is something to be prepared for. You know, if we do get some moisture and cold, that's probably the most complicating factor. Uh, bedding cattle is very effective at helping them maintain body temperature. Uh, wind breaks, uh, if you can get them out of the wind and, and, and give them more comfort, it's always a plus. What cattle normally do in the wintertime under cold stress would be to increase intake and uh, that's their way of compensating for burning more energy to maintain body temperatures. To be honest though, uh, unless we have major blizzards or storms, cattle are very good at handling cold temperatures and uh, in fact are more comfortable when it's 30 to 50 degrees outside than they are when it gets warm or, or real cold. As Galen mentioned, cattle producers are still facing short supplies of forage and high price feed as the state deals with a severe drought. As we approach winter, UNL is offering a workshop at the end of November in winter drought management for cow herds. UNL Extension Educator Monty Stoffer explains what attendees can expect. Well, we're really going to talk about stretching our forage supplies since both pasture and hay was uh, pretty short this year and maybe next year so we're going to talk about stretching our forage supplies and any supplements or alternative feed stuffs that we could use. Uh, also we'll be talking about nitrate testing of these forages me. many times when there's low, stress on those crops there is some high nitrogen tests really in those forages and the then uh, Dr. Rick Rasby, the University so Beef Specialist, will be talking about feeding, how to feed these high nitrate forages if there is a problem. The event will be held November 29th at the ARDC near Mead. The registration fee is $60, and to sign up or find more information, you can contact your local Extension office. In a major multi-university research project examining E. coli infections in cattle, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln has been chosen as the lead entity. The November Nebraska Farmer explains the objectives behind the project, which is funded by a $25 million USDA grant. Rodney Moxley, a UNL veterinarian and researcher, says the study may lead to more effective E. coli vaccines for cattle. Moxley says it's the largest ever USDA grant to UNL, and one of the largest grants it has ever received. You can read more about the studies in the November Nebraska Farmer. Ken Green delivered the inaugural Angler Lecture last week to the students in the Angler Agribusiness Entrepreneurship Program here at UNL. Green is a Nebraska native and UNL alum who's now the managing partner of Agri Holdings LP in Firestone, Colorado. Agri Holdings is comprised of several companies, one of which manufactures cattle supplements and works in the nutrition and consulting sector of the feedlot industry. Aside from Agri Holdings, Ken is also actively involved in the cattle business, feeding about 124,000 head of cattle in western Nebraska and Colorado. Since his interest spread the Midwest, we started our conversation by asking about the impact of a historic drought that has swept the country. It's, it's been huge and it's uh, not going to get solved very quickly. We had an extended drought in Texas and uh, the southwest, which is still one of the, the primary producers of cow-calf operations. Um, that, that was devastating. A lot of cows were killed and uh, liquidated, frankly, way beyond the, the normal life cycle of a cow, just because they ran out of feed. About the time that drought is over, we, we've, had, we've experienced this, the, the one in the northern tier of the country, right up through the yeah. Corn Belt. So we've had some of those same issues there. So we've had a country that's already been short of feed, and uh, it's caused some liquidation. And it's, it's, it's caught us at a time when our numbers were already down. Right. So now it's worse, and it's going to take time for that, that cow population to be rebuilt, but it's essential that we do. Do you feel like the industry has a hold on it now? They know where they need to be or where yeah, they I, need I to go? I think so. I, I think so. I mean, the, the numbers are pretty real, and, and uh, we're, we're good at counting. <laughs> so we, we kind of know what, what, what the situation is. It's just a matter of the economics of making a cow. Right. 
You know, yeah. particularly when you're short of feed, feed's expensive. You're starting out with a, an expensive calf, and a, you know, or a female, and uh, to make a cow, it's a, it's a commitment. It's a major commitment. Overall, agriculture's done fairly well this year. Uh, agriculture's been on a heck of a run here <laughs> for a while, really. Does I mean, it? It's, we're, we're not, we're not uh, guilty of anybody worrying about us not paying taxes, right. believe me. We've, we've done well. <laughs> Does it worry you that uh, perhaps the state of the overall economy could eventually spill over into agriculture? We will some. Uh, for no other reason in, in that we're, we're on such a high tide mm -hmm. here throughout the country in ag. Um, healthy markets need to stop and pause just for a little bit anyway. These land values and everything that are being driven the way they are can't go on. So th there's going to be a pause just for that reason. The other reason is simply that there's other parts of the world that do in fact have bigger problems than we do. And uh, this is a world market. Things that we sell, that I produce, portions of it end up overseas. Mm. And that demand is going to be tempered some. There's no two ways about it. You're still concerned about Europe? Very. Yeah. Yeah, very. Europe's a big deal. Asia's not as big a deal. But mm -hmm. there again, their crest is so high, they're going to come back to something that's the new normal, which will be lower than the new high. Yeah. And uh, so we'll feel that a little bit too. But th that's fine. That, that's pretty normal. And uh, the good news is that the demand we have is real. And that solves a lot of problems. It's not <laughs> like we're. You know, it's not like a government program pumping money into something. Right. We're, it's real. People want what we're doing here. And as long as that's the case, we'll be fine. We'll have to make some adjustments, make good business decisions, but it'll be good. Your concern over land prices, is it that uh, the commodity prices now aren't sustainable for um, a long range? It's some, yeah, in some cases that's true. Some of it is just uh, what, what they used to call and still do, ir irrational exuberance. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just over the top. And, and it's produced by, you know, I, and if a guy's got, or a gal or a family has um, a, a lower basis on their overall farm, mm -hmm. and they, they're just looking at that little piece next door, and it ends up going for 13000 an acre, uh, you know, so it averages out and it's okay. But if you're trying to build a business around that kind of number, it won't look very very good down the road. Well, and it's this, not sustainable. This rolls in well. You talked to the uh, students in the Angler program program mm -hmm. last night. Young mm -hmm. farmers that are getting in right now. I mean, they're they're facing something that uh, you know the farmers before them probably didn't in the cost and land prices and just mm -hmm. getting in and finding that land. But mm -hmm. overall, in agriculture, uh, are you confident that there are enough opportunities for young people who want to get into the industry? The key is want to, and. One of the refreshing and frankly pretty emotional things that those of us that are around that Engler program have experienced is these kids want to. And Paul has done a wonderful job of developing that. And uh, the, the faculty has just really come to step in and do all the right things too. It's, it's great to see. So yeah, th those kids want to and they're going to they're gonna find it and they're going to do it. They're also going to be coming out of a, out of school at a time when, um, you know, the average age of what's going on out here in agriculture is, you know, even me, you know, I used to be the young guy in the room everywhere I went. Uh, frankly, now I'm the old guy, you know, this is, and I'm still on the younger, I'm on the younger tier of the old guys. I'm in my early 60s. But, you know, we're all getting a little long in the tooth, and so there's a lot of experience. There's lots of opportunities for, for young people that want to. And willing to get out there and do it. Now with his weekly weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here again for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the primary forecast, let's take a look at what's happened over this last seven day period. Of course, the main precipitation event was last weekend as we've seen some severe thunderstorm activity break out with the associated upper low that came ju uh, jumping out of the central Rocky Mountain and rapidly moved up toward the northern plains and laid down a pretty significant area of snow in south central Canada and also across much of the Dakota, North Dakota and Montana. For us here, we again got dry slotted in portions of central and western Nebraska. We did see some accumulating snow in the panhandle, so the same old song and dance. The areas in the center part of the state that was desperately moisture, unfortunately, 
we're hard pressed to see anything significant with this storm system and now we don't see anything significant at least in terms of precipitation for Nebraska for the better part of the next seven to ten day period. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we can expect as we go through this next seven day period which also does include the beginning of the holiday weekend and you will notice that we do have high pressure that is sitting somewhere over the southern plains regions and we have a trough approach in the northwest so the loft we have a southwest southwesterly flow. It looks like all the moisture will wrap around this ridge and it looks like we will stay pr pretty much precipitation free as this energy shifts toward the Great Lakes. As we go to tomorrow, what you will notice is there is a little bit of that trough trying to work in. We might get some high clouds in western Nebraska, but for the most part, again, we still have that southwesterly flow and we're expecting some very nice temperatures. The only significant cool down that we can see during this period is a little piece of energy tries to make its way into the Great Lakes and that may push temperatures down a few degrees on Monday. It might increase the clouds and there might be a chance for an isolated sprinkle across eastern Nebraska, but I think the primary focus of moisture will remain in the Iowa and points to the east. Now as we go into Tuesday, what we're going to notice is the ridge starts to reestablish itself and we look like we're going to be into a very warm trend as we move from Tuesday through uh, Friday of next week as temperatures gradually increase and we'll be pushing the 60 degree mark with basically a ridge and a loft and all the moisture again staying well to the north of us and to the east and to the west, nothing in the center or southern part of the country. As we get to Thursday, we start to see this ridge shifting toward east and you'll notice a little bit of this energy tries to make its way into the northern plains from that trough entering the Pacific coast, but it doesn't reach Nebraska. And as we get into Friday, now this energy starts to dip down and there's a very good possibility we could see some precipitation breaking out during the game in Iowa City between Nebraska and Iowa City or Iowa. We'll have to wait and see whether or not there is a significant amount of moisture associated with the system. It's just a little too early to tell. Now as we go to the uh, typical temperature forecast, we are looking at primarily 50s and 60s this weekend with a few clouds. And then we're going to jump up with a cool down on Monday into the 40s the low 50s and then we're going to jump back up into 60s and it looks like a beautiful day for Thanksgiving 62 to 72 uh, coolest temperatures will be to the north warmest to the south 8 to 14 or 8 to 14 day forecast indicates above normal temperatures in terms of precipitation drier than normal although there is a significant storm that does look like it may move its way in as we get into the post holiday weekend thanks Al today's interviews with Frayne Olson Al Dutcher Galen Erickson and Ken Green are archived on the Market Journal website and YouTube page where you can view them at any time next week Shane Ellis from Iowa State is our livestock market analyst after a year of severe drought we'll look at seeding rate options in Nebraska and we'll tell you about the census of agriculture until then thanks for watching I'm Jeff Wilkerson we'll see you next week join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.